We for one Saturday and everybody gone. Well, man, as long as you're here, amen. As long as I have a few ears that are willing to listen, amen. It's not my word. It's not what I say. It's what the Word of God says. Amen. I only do my part to share what it says. And the rest is completely on you. What you do with it, how you cherish it, what, how you handle it, whether you disregard it or whatever, or you apply it, that's completely on you. Amen. We get to heaven, I'll say, hey, I taught them. So let's uh, stand for just a moment and pray. All of us forget all your business from prior days, the days past, the worries of tomorrow. Just shed them off for a moment and, and concentrate and focus on God and ask your request and put in your petitions this morning, amen, for, for not maybe not only yourself, but family, friends, neighbors, whoever it may be that you know needs the Lord this morning. And, Pray for souls that be that they come back to the church, amen, and help us to be a vessel, a worker, a servant to be out in the field. Lord, we ask that you would move on us this morning and let your spirit move on our hearts and in our minds this morning. Let your word penetrate, let your word uh, speak, and let your word uh, soften these uh, hearts of rock and stone. And, and to help it to encourage us and lift, lift us up and help us to see our, our work and our calling and our, our visions and put everything into perspective in our lives. In Jesus' name, let us not be unmoved by your word and your, your work this day. In Jesus' name, I ask you to speak to us and use me as a microphone. I ask that you would teach this morning in Jesus' name, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory. We thank you for being a great God, a mighty God, a God that sees everything and is always there. Thank you, God, for everything. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we'll see for a moment and turn to the book of Jeremiah. I'll be kind of just pointing out some scripture and uh, we know Jeremiah to be the weeping prophet. Amen. And our lesson title today is Unmoved by God's Word. And the lesson big idea says, I will heed and obey God's Word. To heed is to give attention to and obey God's Word. And the uh, truth about God says God expects us to heed and obey His Word. Our focus verse taken out of Jeremiah chapter 36 and verse 24. You have to read this whole entire book. It's a very, uh, very straightforward, very gripping book and the Lord uh, speaks to His children very sternly and, and just lays out discipline on what He can do if we are uh, unconcerned about His Word. We just treat His Word as if it were nothing. And the Lord lays out a bunch of warnings. And uh, but in, in verse 24, it says, Yet they were not afraid nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. I believe it's the first one to 38 chapters of the Lord just tells, speaking to his people and being stern with them and warning them and pointing out all of their inadequacies, all their shortcomings, and just points out everything about their religion, their their their, their idols and their everything. And but after chapter 39 is when he changes his tone and says if you 
would come back to me and repent and, and he gives blessings. So the point of the lesson today is on repentance. <clears throat> Judah at this point had come to a place in their lives where God had to finally step in. They were on the spot, they were on a straight downward spiral going fast. The Lord had to intervene and the Lord had to uh, redeem and step in and, and be the Father and the God that He is. And our lesson talks about Josiah. It was under Josiah's reign that the children of God were prosperous. They, they were doing good under Josiah's rule and reign. And they were protected. They had a shield, a, a covering. And the Bible says that the people actually committed unanimously to keep the Lord's commandments and His testimonies and His statutes. And they committed to, to follow it with all of their hearts and with all of their souls. And it says to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book is what they all agreed to do in 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 3. They all shared, combined their trust and hope and faith in God and said they would follow Him. But it was after Josiah's death, the people made Josiah's son, Jehoaz, king to be in his place, his father's place. But the Bible says about Jehoaz, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And Jehoaz only reigned for three months when he was captured and thrown into prison. And the person after him, which is his brother, his brother Jehoiakim, he was next appointed to be king and the Bible says he also did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Think about that. That's very unfortunate for King Josiah. It's unfortunate for King Josiah what the Bible says about him. That there was no king like Josiah before him, after him, there was no one like Josiah that turned to God with all his heart, with all his might, served God with all of his strength, that did everything according to the law of Moses. And it says about Josiah, there was none other like him after his death. That's unfortunate because his very own sons turned out to be so evil and wicked. And it says they did completely the opposite of what their father did. It says they reversed everything that their father had planned. That's sad. And whatever the reason, whatever the reason was for his kids to become so evil, the Lord still sought to reach out to them, to warn them, to warn them to change their ways and turn from their wicked and evil ways so that He may forgive them of their iniquities and forgive them of their sins. The Lord was still willing to work with His sons, although they were evil and corrupt. He did so by speaking to the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. The Lord spoke directly to Jeremiah. And Jer Jeremiah had a servant write out everything that he was speaking. And the Lord says, tell these words. Give these words to my people, Judah. And so that's what happened. The servant wrote down everything Jeremiah was saying, wrote it down. And they went to the people of Judah. They read exactly what the word the words of God spoke, what the, Lord, what the Lord said. And some of the people heard, and the Bible says some of them repented. 
But then Jehoiakim says, I want to hear these words for myself. So he sent one of his servants to go and get the scroll that had been written directly from God himself. And they begin to read it to him. And, have, and as his servant was reading these words to him, and the lesson says, after reading three or four columns off that scroll, Jehoiakim would cut off what was read and just throw it into the fire. And he did this until the entire scroll was destroyed. He did this until the entire words of God that were written were thrown into the fire. And it says that some of his servants were begging him out of fear to stop what he was doing. But the Bible says Jehoiakim was not afraid. They did not rent their garments to king nor any of his servants. They wouldn't listen. We also as a church, as saints, as children of God, we've got to be very careful to never become like these people, to be unmoved, to be unconcerned about God's words. We must be careful to never fall into a place where we disrespect the Word of God, where we disregard the Word of God where we treat this holy book and these holy words as unholy. We must never get to that point in our lives where the Word of God is just the Word of God. We've got to treat it as though it was our lifeline. We've got to stand on it. We've got to put our entire hope and trust and life our lives depend on it. Our souls and our eternity depends on what we do with this Word. It is very important. It's life-changing. It's life-healing. It's a salvation. It's a deliverance, a help, a security, a covering, a peace, a warmth. It's eternal. It's powerful. It's weapons. It's everything. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. What does that mean? That means it came directly from God's mouth. Just like the words that was read to a Jehoiakim. It came directly out of God's mouth. They wrote it down and they read it. This, this word that we have or that we're reading out of the Bibles that you have on your lap is an exact same thing. It was inspired by God. It came directly out of God's mouth under His breath. And it says it is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is profitable for teaching it is for reproof. Reproof means it, it, it rebukes us and it reprimands us. It gets us back in line. And we may be going to the left or the right or we may be all lost. His word will point out our flaws, our inadequacies, where we're doing wrong. It can even clean spots and stains and get us back where we need to be. It's for reproof and it's for correction and instruction in righteousness. It gets us in line with God. It gets us to God's way of thinking, His plan, His purpose, His will, His outlook, His vision, not ours. This word we have is the most powerful thing that we could ever have possession of. We can't be unmoved by it. We can't not 
We can't treat it as though it were unholy or unliving or unalive. The word we have is alive and it is living. It is powerful and pure, able to separate bone from marrow, able to separate spirit from soul. This word is our lifeline. This word is not only just to be read, this book is to be obeyed and heeded and lived by and given complete attention to and not to go unnoticed. Every day we should take a peek into its, in its pages. Every day we should make it our, our, our priority to just have a moment with God and just read a daily scripture. Somehow we need to ingest it every day. We need to bask in it the moment we wake up throughout the day. Let it just let it just radiate in our mind and our hearts and let it speak to us throughout the day. Deuteronomy chapter 9 says, Therefore, Know that the Lord your God, that He is God. He is a faithful God who keeps His covenant and His mercy for a thousand years. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments, you shall keep the statutes, and you shall keep the judgment, judgments which I command you today and to observe them. What an awesome instruction. He's faithful to His Word, His covenant, His mercy, His promises that He made for a thousand generations. We've only been alive in existence for what? Two generations or something like that. Therefore, it says you shall keep His commandments, His statutes, His judgments, and observe them. Church, the time is coming when the Bible says that people will not tolerate sound doctrine. It'll offend them. It'll prick in their hearts. They won't agree with it. They want, it won't align with their beliefs. It won't align to what they're thinking. It won't align with their lifestyle. It won't mess with how they've been raised and how they've been taught, what they've learned in school, or what they've learned in their outcome. It's not going to agree with them. The time's going to come when they won't tolerate the Word of God. Sound doctrine. It says, it says they won't tolerate it. That it'll offend them. It'll hurt them. It'll anger them. It'll cause them to grow bitter and reject the Word of God. Reject God. Reject the church. Do you think that time is still coming? Or is it here? It's probably here or it is here already. You and I probably know some people who just flat out reject the word, witness, testimonies. I was talking to my coworker yesterday and he was telling me about his Catholic Episcopalian and all these other religions and experience. And he says they have a, a gay bishop. And he's going back and forth with it. He's, he's, he was unsure whether that was right. And he always just grabbed him by the neck and said, Wake up! Of course that ain't right. But that's what we have today. Our world is offended by God's Word. More and more people are turning from the Word. More and more people are forsaking His words. 
which means that they're walking away from God's words. And it was an interesting something else that he said, my co-worker, he says, I remember when I was small, there used to be a Pentecostal church. He named it, but I can't remember, in Aztec. I didn't know there was a Pentecostal church in Aztec. But he said, I was a neighbor to that church. We lived next door. And he says, these people used to get loud. They used to speak in tongues. They used to jump and run and get loud and play music. And he says, I would sit outside and listen to them until one day they drew me in. He said, I started to go to their Sunday school classes. I began, that's, that's what I still believe. He says, down deep in my heart, I know that's still true and real. But he says, now nah, I've been introduced to this religion, that religion, this religion, that religion. Can call the Word of God. Jehoiakim, he was a perfect example of those who wish to control what they heard from God. Perfect example. God's Word is the complete authority. We don't question it. We don't add to it. We don't take away from it. It is proof. It is doctrine. It is set. It is pure. It is complete authority. We can't redesign it. We can't twist it to meet our beliefs. We can't change it to fit our lifestyle. No way that we can change the Word of God. God's Word is complete. But we choose sometimes to control it. When we refuse to hear it, when we refuse even to just read it, we control it when we choose to disobey it. We control it when we're not faithful to it. When, it's, when, when, it, when we're not drawing from it daily. When we don't go by, when we don't live, when we don't cherish it, when we don't love it, when we don't hold it near and dear to our hearts. When we only hear, read from it on Sunday mornings. We could be like Jehoiakim in control of what we what we want to hear, what we want to, how much we get in, the limited supply. That ain't gonna work. I pray that we're not controlling what we hear from this pulpit. I pray that we're we don't have the spirit or the intention of Jehoiakim, unafraid, disregarding his word and everything that is taught. I hope we cherish it and pray that. I pray that we don't refuse it, just set it aside and treat it as though it's not important. And some of those that are controlling say things like, well, I'll go to church on Sunday, but don't tell me to come on Wednesday or Thursday for Bible study and Bible reading and end time reading. I'll go Sunday and I'll choose when I decide to go to church. Or some will say, I'll drop in a few dollars here in the offering basket. Offering basket. Don't tell me to tithe from my from my uh, my check. Don't tell me to tithe and give more than that. Some will say, I'll, I'll pray some on Sunday. But don't tell me to fast and pray and sacrifice any more than that. I have my own prayer life. I have my own communication and relationship with God. God hears me. God sees me. God knows me. He knows when I pray. He knows when I reach out to Him. That's controlling God's Word. 
God's Word should be controlling us. It should drive us to draw near. It should drive us to prayer. It should drive us to, to tears and drive us to our knees and drive us to prayer and drive us and crave the presence and the, the, the fellowship in the church. It should drive us to do more for the church. It should drive us to be a part of church. It should drive us to want to be more involved, to get plugged in, to be a part of where can I be used? What I have this ability. I want to help the church. I want to be a part of it. Hey, how can I give a little more? What can I do? I'm here. I'm available. Use me. That's how the Lord of God should be controlling us, moving us, and driving us. The more we control God's Word, the more we do it, the more we become desensitized. The more we control the words of God, the more unmoved we become. We think, well, nothing happened to me that time. Like Jehoiakim, we become unafraid of His laws. We become unafraid of His statutes, of His rules. It's like throwing His words into the fire. We do exactly what Jehovah can do. We disregard, we pick and choose, we throw his words into the fire. We become unconcerned, disrespectful, disregarding, and think of his words as not holy and alive, pure, genuine, unmoving. But it's the opposite of that. Have we honestly really tried God? Have we honestly, truly tried to read His Word? I mean, when was the last time you read the Bible from beginning to the end? That should be our yearly devotion to read the Bible in its entirety. I'm speaking to myself too. When's the, when's the last time you had your own personal devotion, your own personal revival of wherever you were at? Two Sundays ago, two Sundays ago, I said, make it, make yourself some time throughout the day, throughout the week. Just drop yourselves down and worship God. How many of you have actually done that? Gave a few moments to the Lord and had your own little prayer service, little worship service, a little offering service somewhere as you're walking. We can't throw any of his words. And the fire. The Bible says every dot, every every slash, every word, every syllable, every pronunciation, everything is powerful and living and alive. We can't treat it. We can't be unmoved by God's word. Back to our lesson. It was at this point in the lives and. In the lives of God's people, the Jew, the Jew, the nation, it was at this point when, when God had to step in. They'd gone so far out of control, and the Lord had to step in and try to reap to redeem His people and offer forgiveness, even though they were wicked, evil. God still extended His hand to forgive them. It began by God warning them, sending a word of warning. He was telling His people, read chapter 2, Jeremiah, it lists all the things that the Lord pointed out that Judah was doing. He told His people, I seen everything that you've been doing. I noticed everything that you've said and done. I seen where all of your hearts are. I know where all of your hearts are at. I know your ways. I know your intentions. I know who you worship. I know what comes out of your mouth. I know your 
thoughts, I know, I know and I've seen your ways, I've seen the way you've lived your lives, I've seen the way you treat each other, I've seen how you are in your family, in your relationship, with your spouse, with your kids, I've seen it all and I notice how you no longer reverence anything my word says. You no longer remember the words of Josiah, my son, my prophet. You forgot everything that Josiah laid down, the rules and the laws and the worship and God being priority. And look what it says in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 9. It says, therefore, I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord. And against your children's children, I will bring charges. And this is after the Lord told His children all things that were they were doing wrong. Think about that. I will bring you charges. It's one thing for a, a prosecutor to bring charges. It's one thing for a lawyer himself to bring charges. It's one thing for a a, a jury to bring charges, but for the judge himself to bring charges against you, that is on a completely different level. If the judge himself brings charges to you, I'd open my eyes. Verse 12 and verse 13 of the same chapter, the Lord tells them, you need to be astonished, O heavens, at this. You should be horribly afraid. You should be very desolate, says the Lord. What is desolate? Desolate means to be a deserted people in a state of emptiness. That's what the Lord charged His very own children with. Be afraid. I'm bringing charges against you. I'm fixing to desert and leave you empty. Be astonished. Be afraid again. You never were afraid before. But now I'm going to have to remind you what it is to reverence me and respect me and treat my words as holy and pure. It's unadulterated. It's still true words that came from my mouth, my inspiration. And you've mishandled it all these years, but now you've got to remember I'm bringing charges. In verse 13 it says, you've committed two evils. I wish I could explain these two evils. But the first thing he said, he says, you've committed two evils. The first one, you have forsaken me. You have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. You've forsaken me, the fountain where life springs from. And the second one is, you made your own cisterns. You made your own broken cisterns that hold no water. I would never want to come to a place where God has to humble me like this to make me horribly afraid and to feel deserted and to feel to fall into a state of emptiness i would hate to ever get to that point in my life to feel those horrible feelings of, 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 of leaving the presence of god and not feeling his presence anymore and be afraid and feel deserted I don't ever want to get to that place where I take God's Word lightly. I, I don't want to bring charges 
to my children and my children's children because of my lack of fear and reverence for his word, for his house, for his work, for his calling, for my ministry. I don't dare bring charges to my children's children because of my lack of fear and reverence for the things of God. But did you know the right kind of fear dissolves the wrong kinds of fears? A holy fear is a holy reverence for the things of God. Once we know how to fear God, fear, we, it's a whole other lesson, but fear is reverence for God. Once we know how to fear and respect His Word, everything about God, then all this other fear will just dissolve. The world we fear, the, 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 the fear that comes from the enemy when He's speaking to us, telling us all, we'll know, our spirit will know how to decipher from bad fear, negative fear, the enemy fear, the worldly fear, our own carnal human fear. It'll know the right fear. It'll perform the right fear. The right fear dissolves the wrong kinds of fears. The Bible says it's better to obey and God expects us to heed and take notice and pay special attention to His instruction, His words, His ways, His laws, His statutes, His work, His calling, His ministry, His people, His chosen, His servants, His children, His elected. That's us, that's you and I. Pay, pay, pay special attention to my things. And what does it say? It will lead you into all righteousness. Notice in Jeremiah chapter 2, it says, My people have committed two evils. And the second one, the broken systems. But in chapter 2, he had a whole couple chapters, but he only boils it down to two. You forsaken me, the living water. You made your own sisters that hold no water. They turned and walked away from me, the fountain of living water. He says, you walked away from the life-giving source, which is me. John chapter 7, verse 38 says, He that believes on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So how do we get that? When we completely put our trust, our faith, everything, our might, our soul, our strength on this word, on these words, on this truth, he says you will never thirst again. And you will always be satisfied. So when we get our eyes off of this world, off of the things in this world, off of ourselves, when we quit being selfish, when we begin to pursue godly things and pursue the things of God, only then can we experience true joy that surpasses all understanding. If we know how to draw water from the well, from Him, from His work, His ways, that water is just out of your belly. You'll have it constantly. When we commit to live like Christ lived, when we strive to have the kind of love He had, and when we strive to have the same compassion that Jesus had and share His burdens, only then will we, will we be truly satisfied and happy and live a fruitful life prosperous, meaningful life. Hallelujah. But it says they made themselves 
their own little water containers, their own little cisterns that held no water whatsoever. Without God, we try to make our own way and try to make ourselves happy, give ourselves joy. We buy this, we do this, we think this will bring happiness and peace and love and joy. But in the end, there's no real fulfillment as you would if you pursue godly things. We know that, right? If we pursue our own things, our own ways, in the end, it turns out to nothing. It, it's like that uh, example the Bible gives. Uh, we have a dad, we pour water into the pit. There's a hole. It's never, it's, it's always this empty. Without God, we, without God, we try to make our own peace and joy. And it will never hold water. Whatever we try to do outside of God turns into something of no profit, empty and just wasteful. We've wasted our time pursuing with our own strength and our own might. God did create us. So therefore, He has to know exactly what we need. He formed us. He shaped us. He has to know exactly what we need in order to function properly. It's like a, a book you get with your automobile, the, the, the maintenance schedule, and this kind, and this kind, the exact same way. He knows exactly what we need to function pro properly. He knows exactly what we need to make us happy, to keep us happy, to live in peace, to live prosperously, to live with joy, true joy, and satisfaction to be fulfilled. He knows what we need to have a happy home, a happy life, a happy marriage, good kids, prosperous kids, a thriving good family, good home, everything. He knows it. He said, Judah, why didn't you walk away from this? I was the fountain of living water, but you walked the other way. Why did you forsake me? the source of your living water. So church this morning, I, I want to just remind you of our title this morning. We must never become unmoved by God's Word. We must never get to that place where it doesn't stir us where it doesn't move us, where it doesn't make us cry, where it doesn't move us and stir us and touch our hearts. And we must never take for granted what we have here today, where we're sitting, what we're sitting in. We never should come to a place where we take for granted all the things we have. We have Sunday school teachers. We have people that pray, that teach our kids. We come together. We, we put all these lessons together to encourage one another. I'm no great teacher by any means, but it's in my heart to give you the word. It's my heart that I, I come here to pray. So I want to be effective. Let the people in here, let the people feel let the people move, let the people change. God touched them, God speak to them. We can't take for granted the people that give their hearts and pour out their, their, their everything in them to make this work. Amen. This church and this word and these lessons won't always be here. One of these days is going to be gone. The opportunity to repent and make things right is open today. Take advantage of the opportunity that you're still here. The grace of God is still on the earth. Take advantage of it. The Spirit still flows through this world. He's built everywhere. His presence is still here on this world. But it won't always be available. It won't always be here. We must learn how to draw from that well individually like that woman at the well. She asked, why do you ask me of water? And Jesus said, 
you don't know who I am and what I have, this water that I have, you'll never thirst again. It'll satisfy you. It'll get you on track. It is, it is the road to righteousness and salvation and repentance. It'll change your life. We need to drink from this well every chance we get. We need a hunger for His Word every chance we get. We need to have our faces in His Word of God every day, every chance. We need to cherish His Word. We need to memorize as much of His Word as we can. Put more and more of it into our heart. Let it move us. Let it stir us. We can't be unmoved any longer. We've got a hunger for it. We've got a thirst for it. Like our life depends on it. We got to desire the things of God more than the things of this world. The Bible says the things of this world are going to perish. We can't take anything. The Bible says heaven and earth shall pass, but my word will never pass away. His word is living, so read it. It'll change you. The Bible says his word is alive. Read it and you'll feel his presence. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear my words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. For the time is near. I want to read that one more time. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. And I'll close. And blessed is he. Blessed is you and I if we would just only read and hear his words and keep what we've heard and read. Because the time is near. Hallelujah. Are you ready to leave this world? Too tired of all this stuff that's happening. We have a hope. We have a refuge. We should be joyous and we should be excited knowing that one day we're going to be leaving and our families with us. Amen. We ought to look forward to that day. The Bible says, encourage one another with these words. Amen. Hallelujah.